Forward. We observe that, when a storm or other disaster sent from the heavens strikes an entire crop to the ground, even among the low hedges or bushes standing by the roadside, a small space is secured and individual ears of grain remain upright. Then, when the sun shines favorably again, they grow on, lonely and unnoticed, not cut by an early sickle for the large storehouses, but in late summer, when they have become ripe and full, poor, devout hands come to seek them, and ear by ear, carefully bound and valued higher than whole sheaves, they are carried home, providing sustenance throughout the winter, perhaps even the only seed for the future. This is how we feel when we consider the wealth of German poetry in early times, and then see that so much of it has not survived that even the memory of it has been lost, and only folk songs and these innocent household tales remain. The places by the stove, the kitchen hearth, the attic stairs, still celebrated holidays, pastures and forests in their stillness, and above all, the unclouded imagination have been the hedges that have safeguarded them and passed them down from one time to another. Thus, after surveying this collection, we think this way. Initially, we believed that much had already been lost here, and only the tales were left which we ourselves were aware of, and which were told differently, as always. However, attentive to everything that is truly left of poetry, we wanted to understand these variations as well, and yet many new ones emerged. Although we are not in a position to inquire far and wide, our collection grew from year to year, so that now, after about six years have passed, it appears rich to us, we also understand that much may still be missing, but we are also pleased with the thought of possessing the most and best. With few exceptions, everything was collected almost exclusively in Hesse and the Maine and Kinzig regions of Hanau County, where we come from, based on oral tradition, therefore, each individual tale still holds a pleasant memory for us. Few books have been created with such joy, and we gladly thank publicly here all who have contributed to it. Perhaps it was the right time to record these tales, as those who should preserve them are becoming increasingly rare, admittedly, those who still know them know a lot because people are dying not because they don't tell them to others, for the customs therein are themselves diminishing, as all secret pl places and homes and gardens give way to an empty grandeur that resembles the smile with which they are spoken of, which looks noble but costs so little. Where they still exist, they live so that one does not think about whether they are good or bad, poetic or absurd, one knows and loves them because they were received in that way and takes pleasure in them without reason. Such is the beauty of the customs, indeed, this poetry has in common with all that is imperishable that one must be inclined towards it, even against one's own will. It is easy to notice, however, that they have only adhered where there has generally been a more vibrant receptivity for poetry or an imagination not yet extinguished by life's perversions. We do not intend to praise or even defend these tales against an opposing opinion here in the same sense, their mere existence is enough to protect them. What has pleased, moved, and taught us in so many ways, repeatedly and always anew, carries its necessity within itself and has undoubtedly come from that eternal source that touches all life, and although it may only be a single drop held by a small, cohesive leaf, it still glistens in the first light. Internally, the same purity runs through these tales that make children appear so wonderful and blissful to us. They seem to have the same bluish-white, flawless, shining eyes, into which little children love to reach, that cannot grow anymore while their other limbs are still delicate, weak, and unsuitable for the ser service of the earth. Most situations are so simple that many people may have encountered them in life, but like all truths, they are always new and moving. Parents have no bread and must abandon their children in this distress, or a harsh stepmother lets them suffer, and may even want them to perish. Then, siblings are left alone in the solitude of the woods, frightened by the wind, fearing wild animals, but they stand by each other faithfully. The little brother knows the way back home, or the sister, if transformed by magic into a fawn, guides it and searches for herbs and moss for its bed. Or she sits silently and sews a shirt out of starflowers that destroys the spell. The entire world in this setting is closed off and determined, kings, princes, faithful servants, and honest craftsmen, especially fishermen, millers, coalmen, and shepherds, who remain closest to nature, are present in it, the rest is foreign and unknown to them. Also, as in myths that speak of the golden age, the entire nature is alive, and the sun, moon, and stars are accessible, give gifts, or even let themselves be woven into clothes. In the mountains, the dwarves work with metal, and in the water, the mermaids sleep. The birds, doves are the most beloved and helpful, plants, and stones speak and know how to express their sympathy. Even blood itself calls and speaks, and thus, this poetry already exercises rights that later literature only strives for in metaphors. 
This innocent intimacy of the greatest and smallest has an indescribable loveliness to it, and we would rather listen to the conversation of the star stars with a poor abandoned child in the woods than to the sound of the spheres. Everything beautiful is golden and sprinkled with pearls, even golden people live here. Misfortune, however, is a dark power, a monstrous man-eating giant, who is defeated again because a good woman stands by his side and knows how to avert the crisis successfully, and this epic always ends by opening up an endless joy. Evil, too, is not a small, close and worse thing, because one could get used to it, but something dreadful, black, strictly separated, which one must not approach. The punishment for it is equally terrible, snakes and poisonous worms consume their victim, or it must dance itself to death in glowing iron shoes. Many things also have their own meaning, the mother will have her real child back in her arms in the moment she can make the changeling that the house spirits have given her laugh. Just as a child's life begins with a smile and continues in joy, but the angels speak to it when it smiles in sleep. Thus, a quarter of an hour daily is beyond the power of magic, where the human form emerges freely, as if no force could envelop us completely, and every day grants us minutes when we sh shake off all falsehood and look out from within ourselves. However, the magic is never completely undone, and a swan wing remains instead of an arm, and because a tear has fallen, an eye is lost with it, or worldly wisdom is humbled, and the fool, laughed at and pushed aside by everyone, but pure of heart, alone wins happiness. These qualities form the basis for the fact that a good lesson, an application for the present, can be in these qualities, however, it is grounded that such good lessons and applications for the present can be easily derived from these fairy tales, it was neither their purpose nor were they invented for this reason, but it arises from them like a good fruit from a healthy blossom without human intervention. In this way, every genuine poetry proves itself that it can never be without reference to life, for it springs from life, it feeds on it, and can scarcely be understood if it does not appeal to general experience or does not take hold of some living interest. Just as in the folk song, the burden of which is constantly changing and adapting itself to present circumstances, so the fairy tale is more or less modified by each new generation. It is therefore possible that our children will still listen with eager curiosity to stories from the children's and household tales of the Brothers Grimm, and that in the latest edition of them the language will have been changed to suit the latest fashion, while the substance remains unaltered. Because this poetry is so close to the first and simplest life, we see in it the reason for its universal spread, for there is hardly any people that can do without it. Even the Negroes in Western Africa entertain their children with stories, and Strabo expressly states of the Greeks, you will find this testimony at the end with the others, which prove how much those who knew what such a voice that speaks directly to the heart is worth, valued such tales. Another highly remarkable circumstance can also be explained by this, namely the great spread of these German tales. They not only include the heroic legends of Siegfried the Dragon Slayer, but even surpass them, as we find them, and exactly the same, spread throughout Europe, revealing a kinship of the noblest peoples. From the north, we only know the Danish Kempfisser, which contain much relevant material, even if as a song, which is no longer entirely suitable for chil children because it is meant to be sung, but the limit cannot be determined here any more than in the more serious, historical sagas, and there are indeed points of convergence. England does not possess the very rich collection of tab art, but what treasures of oral tradition must still exist in Wales, Scotland, and Ireland, the former alone has a true treasure in its, now printed, Mabinogen. In a similar way, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark have remained rich, perhaps less so the southern countries, nothing is known to us from Spain, but a passage from Cervantes about the existence and telling of fairy tales leaves no doubt. France certainly still has more than what Charles Perrault communicated, who alone still treated them as children's fairy tales, not his inferior imitators, the Alnoy, Marat, he gives only nine, admittedly the most well-known, which also belonged to the most beautiful. His merit consists in having added nothing and leaving the things themselves, apart from trivialities, unchanged, his presentation deserves praise only for being as simple as possible, in itself, the French language, which almost naturally curls up into epigrammatic turns of phrase and finely carved dialogue in its present form, just look at the conversation between Riquet Alahaup and the dumb princess, as well as the end of Petit Pauset, is probably nothing harder than to be naive and straightforward, that is, not with the pretension of telling children's fairy tales, besides, they are sometimes unnecessarily stretched out and broad. An analysis standing before an edition sees it as if Perrault had invented them first, and that they had first come to the people through him, born 1633, died 1703, with Thumbelina, deliberate imitation of Homer is even alleged, 
which was meant to make children understand the distress of Odysseus at Polyphemus, a better view is held by Johanno. Richer than all others are older Italian collections, firstly in the Knights of Straparola, which contain much good material, but especially in the Pentamerone of Basile, a book written in Neapolitan dialect, which is just as well known and popular in Italy as it is rare and unknown in Germany, and which is excellent in every respect. The content is almost without gaps and false additions, the style overflowing with good speeches and sayings. Translating it vividly required a Fischart and his era, however, we intend to translate it into German in the second volume of the present collection, where everything else that foreign sources offer will also find its place. We have endeavored to interpret these fairy tales as purely as possible. In many of them, the narrative is interrupted by rhymes and verses that sometimes even clearly alliterate, but they are never sung while telling the story, and these are precisely the oldest and best ones. No detail has been invented, embellished, or altered, for we would have been ashamed to spoil such rich stories with our own imaginings. We hope that these tales will be received as a valuable contribution to the history of the human spirit and its development, and that they will awaken interest in the study of mythology, which offers a deep and extensive insight into the soul of the people. We also hope that they will be received with indulgence, and that, remembering the spirit of the time and of the people that created them, they will not be judged according to the standards of a later age.